Hello and welcome once again. My name is Sean Shaw and this is Vanguards of Democracy. In the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we have two segments for you that capture the legacy of optimism and activism that Dr. King left behind. Reverend Watson Haynes will be here in our studio to share some of the inspiring work on housing, health, and community empowerment that his organization, the Pinellas County Urban League, has been able to do for the St. Petersburg and Tampa Bay area. But first, I'm joined by my good friend and fraternity brother, Robert Scott, and his cousin, Howard Harris, who are the brains and the brawn behind Tampa's annual Dr. King Parade. I'm very excited to bring these interviews to you all today, so don't go anywhere because they're starting right now. All right, welcome to the next segment of Vanguards of Democracy. This is Sean Sean. I'm here with two people that everyone knows around this time of year. That's Robert Scott and Howard Harris. Uh, and we're going to talk about the MLK, the gala that just happened, and also the parade. I was just telling uh, Robert, uh, my favorite activity uh, is doing the MLK parade. I love it. I love the energy. I love walking in it. I love throwing out candy the first half because I always run out halfway in. Uh, and I love the fellowship after. So, Robert and Howard, thank you all for coming today. You're quite welcome. Glad welcome, to be here. Welcome, welcome. No, I appreciate it. So let's let's get right into it. Let's talk about the gala, how long you've been doing the gala, why we do the gala, and all that good stuff. How? Okay, well, um, the gala was Robert's idea after we took over um, the uh, running of the parade. And, you know, we, we, we talked a lot about what we wanted this to turn into, you know, our effort. Uh, and we wanted it, the parade is a one day event, but we wanted to have lasting community impact. So we wanted to uh, you know, increase the significance to the community. And, you know, Dr. King was about serving the community. And we wanted to make sure that people in Tampa understood that there are folks, everyday folks, some well-known, some not so well-known, who live a life of service, who serve their community in the spirit of Dr. King. So the gala was the perfect uh, opportunity to do that. And so we planned uh, the first gala, I think we did in 2016. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made it our mission to identify people in the community. And so we select four community heroes every year. Uh, and these are people that the community recognizes or not recognized, but we wanna make sure that we highlight what they're doing in the community, doing Dr. King's work. Uh, we also, uh, Dr. King was a big proponent of education. So we also give out scholarships uh, to deserving high school students. And they're not just students who have shown academic excellence, they're students who themselves have already shown that they have a heart for service. So they, they, they're typically involved in many extracurricular activities that show that they're gonna be the kind of people that we can look to in the future. Whenever I'm interviewing young people, whether it be for college admissions or for scholarship committees or whatever I happen to be on, I always gravitate to the students that have more ec extracurricular activities mm -hmm. than just the 4.0 mm -hmm. students. Cause I, quite frankly, I think that point paints a better picture of right. what kind of student it is. Yeah. Um, the scholarships uh, are for what ages and, and what can they use? What do they use them for? <clears throat> Well, they're for high school seniors. It's, it's, it's directed at them going to college. In fact, they don't actually get funded until they show proof of enrollment because we want to make sure that we're making that point. We want you in school. And so the scholarships are directed at high school seniors who are uh, starting their first year. No, it's impressive that it only, this only started in 2016, Robert. And this is, we all know the events that everyone goes to, mm -hmm. right? We know the events that happened that, ah, maybe I'll go. Uh, you all have two events that everyone in the community goes to, <laughs> and that is the gala and that is the parade uh, with MLK. It's impressive that it's been this short, you've been able to get there. Right. Everybody right. goes right. to the gala. And the, and the kids, uh, one young lady had a grade point average of 7.2%. I have never witnessed that in my life. 7.2. You know, some of us graduate, oh, Lordy. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. Yeah, I made it. His grace and his mercy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and just to hear about their ambition, what they want to become when they graduate yeah. college, you know. Some of them want to be lawyers. Some of them want to be doctors. And you just go, wow. They had it together more than us. I thought I was going to mention to you, too, uh, when we first talked about the gala, he and I, and, and, and we shared that. We, we fuss and fight. 
but we cousins. <laughs> yeah. So we go. We even though we fuss to fight, we're gonna come together later on and go out to dinner. But uh, it, it, and it's funny. And I had to fight with him for about a year, year and a half for him to get on board and help me do the gala, you know. And, and now he, I run it. Now he runs <laughs> so that's it. That's how you do it. He took it over, and you know, that's why I said when you start talking about the gala, I said, "Hey, you want power? <laughs> Go ahead, you know." Right. And after we had our very first gala, I asked him, "I said, you think we need to have another one?" He said, "Yeah, we're gonna have yeah. to have more." Because one of the things that um, I felt that, like our grand marshal. Who is the Grand Marshal? What is he about? What did he do or uh, what did she do in order to become the Grand Marshal? And by us having our gala, we can share that. That's also the, one of the ways you introduce the Grand Marshal. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And we can share that information with the community. So the gala is something that we just have to have to let everybody see. And of course, what are y'all doing with the money? Right. And we want them to see that we're giving the money to deserving kids to go to college. Uh, he didn't mention it, but uh, kids who go to college uh, were the first one in their family to go to college. Mm -hmm. And you had another, I think the grade point average was one. Um, um, first in family, grade point average, uh -huh. and um, most improved. Yeah. Most improved because, you know, kids, not every kid comes into school on track you know, knowing what he wants to do. And so we want to recognize and honor those kids who maybe had a, a rough start, but they got it together by the time they got out. So no, that, we, that's great. That, yeah, that's yeah. why everybody comes to the, it's why everybody comes to the event. Y'all have to keep doing it, particularly yeah. as long as people are going to come and buy the tickets you can give away yeah. scholarships. Let's talk about the parade, this year's parade a little bit. It's been a couple of years since we've had it again. I, I, I love this event. Uh, because you get to see people that you haven't seen in a long time. Uh, everybody's wearing their fraternity and sorority colors. And mm -hmm. let me just mention now, Robert Scott is a member of my fraternity, Omega Psi Phi, and Mr. Harris right. is a member of Alpha Alpha, which is okay. It's okay. Uh, but uh, as I know you will mention, Dr. King <laughs> right. was also a member of yours. Let me steal your thunder before right. we spend five minutes, before it's before it's five minutes of my show talking about that. But, uh, but no, we all wear our colors and everyone is out in the community and Robert Scott is directing everybody there at the start. And it's all very well put together. It's very impressive and it's just fun. And, and it's so good to be out in the community for this good reason. And where it is in the community is also important because so. oftentimes negative things are associated with the place where this route is. Correct. And that's why I love the parade. Everybody brings their family, everybody brings their kids, everybody comes even alone, sits in the chair. And this ain't just black people. This is everybody <laughs> in everybody. Tampa comes and sits on this route and watches this. And it's just, it's such a good thing. And I've missed it these last couple of years. So I can't wait to do it, uh, uh, do it this, sure. this, uh, this on year Monday. on Monday. Tell, tell me a little bit about how the parade started, what it's like running it. Because I can tell how stressed out you are. It stresses you out this time of year. And uh, all the floats and people trying to get in at the last minute. And last time you had me in a bad number. And I had to call you to get me boosted up. So uh, it's a whole bunch of things I know. <laughs> there is a lot of stuff involved. Um, floats. We have floats. We have bands. And this year, I'm going to say before he steal my thunder. Before I was steal my <laughs> stuff, uh, thunder. We're having Floyd a &M University. The first time it, uh, that they have been here in March down the streets of Tampa, Florida. So that's a biggie. And I'm going to get in trouble, but let, I, FAMU is universally recognized yes. as the best marching band uh, in uh, this country. Not just HBCU, not just not just the South, but in the country, FAMU is the best marching band. To have them participate in this parade is a big deal. It it's is impressive. a big deal. Uh, I'm not going to... Now send all the hate mail to Robert Scott. <laughs> the fact that I just said that. <laughs> yeah. No, because I'm going to correct you. You have two great bands. Two, that's right. And you are a Wildcat. You have two, that's right. You have two great bands. Cannot forget about those Wildcats right. from Bethune-Cookman University. And it's always a comparison which, which band is good, which one is the best. So I tell everybody, come to the parade. And let them both show and, you. And, and these, and are top, these are the these top. These are the top right. HBCUs. And they're here in Tampa. And you make a decision on which one you think is good and tell me. Let me know. No, this is going to be fun. This is yeah. going to be fun. <laughs> how do you, um, how, how long has this parade been going on? This parade's been going on for about, I want to say at least 30 years. 
at least 30 years. But you got to remember how things are. You got to crawl before yeah. you walk. And what happened is that it was a walk. Uh, the Crusoes got together and they said, well, we're going to um, just put a walk together and work, walk down to uh, City Hall. And then that morphing into a parade, Deputy Fort, uh, Hillsborough County Sheriff, uh, organized it so it become a, a parade. And when he stepped down, then uh, Frank Bell took over for a little while. And then I took it over. And uh, we, since we, Howard and I, and I have to stop and say this too, because I tell everybody, we one for this guy sitting next to me. We probably wouldn't be having a parade, you know, because of his, you know, he had the same passion that I have. This is hard. For, for mm-hmm. Dr. King and what he's done for us. You know, I was a little boy and I was seeing it happen, you know, the assassination mm-hmm. and everything and all for civil rights, all for civil rights. And I'm thinking I'm alive. My parents got an opportunity to watch me grow up. But Dr. King, his children didn't get a chance to spend those wonderful years with him. How could we uh, support him? How could we let everybody know what Dr. King has done and the sacrifice he made? I'm going to have a parade. I'm going to make sure it stays active in the community and people know what Dr. King stood for. You know, nonviolence. <clears throat> Nonviolence and peace and progress. And, and let me just say this: when when Robert first called me and said, "Hey, I I volunteered to take the parade over," I said, "That's why you were getting that call." <laughs> <laughs> that's really good, Robert. Right. <laughs> good thing for you. I'll support you anywhere I can. He said, "Well, I need you funny to help me." Say that. <laughs> yeah, funny you should say that. And uh, we planned our uh, the first Tampa parade, even though it had been going on for years. Prior, the first Tampa parade that we did was in 2015. Mm -hmm. And we planned uh, and organized that whole thing on his dining room table. (laughs) And so after 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 that first year of we got to I think we need an office, (laughs) you know. And so it was it was we knew it was growing. We knew the momentum was going and we wanted to put something in place so that it would be professionally professionally run every year. And so we got an office at the uh, uh, that complex, mm-hmm. and a lot of people know about that. It's a business incubator, uh, a lot of black entrepreneurship going on at that. So it was a perfect place for us to be, to start. In the office, we've had to go into a bigger office, and you know, just the operation has gotten bigger as the city has stepped forward to, to support us. Absolutely. The county has stepped forward, stepped forward to support us. And the sponsors have come on board. So it's just, we, we, we're enjoying watching the growth. A lot of growing pains every year. The parade is born out of several arguments that the cousins have. <laughs> right, right. And, and it just go, gets bigger and bigger. So, you know, we, we, we're, we're blessed. It, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's well put together. Uh, I, I, again, I love it. Because I've, you know, I've been a part of parades that uh, aren't well put together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, it, it makes a huge difference. That's also why everybody participates. Um, what do you think um, this year? Tell me about kind of, you said obviously Pam, you and Bethune, uh, Marching Barons are going to participate. Any other, like who's the Grand Marshal this year and what fraternity might that person be a member of? <laughs> uh, the, the people want to know. I don't know. <laughs> and you want to tell them who the Grand Marshal is and what fraternity he's a member of? Gladly, you know, because as alphas, we're so proud of our children, you know. Anyway. Uh, Get your own podcast, <laughs> uh, Titus O'Neill, WWE superstar Titus O'Neill is our grand marshal. And Titus, everybody knows, he's, he's, he's out front in the community um, uh, uh, doing the work that Dr. King would be proud of. Uh, his philanthropic activities are well known in, in in Tampa, so we thought this would be a good year to put him front and center uh, to uh, complement all the things that he's doing in in the Tampa community. Uh, he, he even though he's an Omega man, he's a good <laughs> he's he's a good man. Uh, Might big up your brother. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, so he's the Grand Marshal. No, he he I I love uh, I love Thaddeus because of what he does in the community mm-hmm. and how he does it. Uh, it's it's he's a he's a treasure here in tampa for what he does and this i mean we've got thaddeus we've got family we got bethune i wanted to mention we also have some of the best local bands 
yes. high school bands uh, in Tampa. I was going to name them, but go ahead. Yeah, you got Middleton High School, Blake High School, Tampa Bay Tech. You got Spodo. 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 I'm sorry, mm -hmm, I was going to mm -hmm. correct me on that. And who else? Jefferson. Jefferson. Yeah, Jeff Jefferson. And we may get a couple more before all is said and done. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to mention, we have two um, equestrian groups and they're, you know, black cowboy groups, mm -hmm. which is a unique kind of thing. And we're real happy to have them. And they've participated with us before. Right. So uh, the, the the horses will be in the parade. Big hit with the kids. No, you know? it is. Yeah. Talk about the specifics of the parade camp. What time does it start? What's the route? Where can people watch it? Where do they line up if they want to watch it? All that good stuff. Great question. Parade starts at 12 o'clock. And I want to reiterate, we are having the parade. It starts at 12 o'clock at the corner of 15th Street and 21st Avenue. Um, and you can see it anywhere along 15th Street from 21st Avenue up to Dr. King, Martin Luther King uh, Boulevard, and from Martin Luther King and 15th up to 22nd, and from 22nd and all. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a two mile parade. Uh, you know, I tell everybody to drink water. It's not that bad. It's not that bad, but a lot of people say it's too right. long. Right. First, we were arguing because it was only a, a, a mile long. Yeah, but it should be longer. Now it's two miles, and they're going, <laughs> man, that's just that's a long way. Right. We're tired. <laughs> no, that's yeah. great. And, and people, if you haven't participated in the parade, one, you need to and, and come watch it. But two, Watch out for the traffic. You're gonna to have to park a little way away and walk mm -hmm. to walk to 22nd or 15th to get a place to watch it and Absolutely. bring a chair and sit there and yeah. you will get beads and candy and everything. Thrown That's in. right. Everything. That's right. Everything. Yes. And if you're in the parade, we try to help you out by having shuttle buses at the end right. to take you back to uh, your parking area. Well, as we were discussing off camera, mm -hmm. the end of the parade is um, is where we have the. Omega Sci-Fi sponsored kind of event where it's food and we'll have some voter registration and we'll have a whole bunch of stuff. And that's usually what a lot of us do after the parade is, you know, right when it ends is hop off there and, and have some more fellowship and have some more of a good time on a positive way. And and um, that's what the day is about. That is, Correct. That's why we do this. I want to ask you all a question, though, about kind of personally. And you mentioned it a little bit, Robert. What does Dr. King's legacy mean to you? Well, it was a legacy, even though we were being beat down. I hate to use that word, but even though we were dealing with a lot of violent things that were going on, uh, it it just seeing as a little kid what was going on. You had the man's restroom, woman's restroom, and the colored restroom. And when we had our gala, I even mentioned we've come a long way. We can't forget that where we've been, but we've come a long way. And we still have a long way to go. So just mentioning Dr. King, thinking about his family and his desire for us to all be treated equal, be treated as one, regardless of your color of your skin, uh, that you would be able to be whatever you want to be, President of the United States, mm -hmm. if you wanted to be. So that's pretty much how it touches me. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, I think about, uh, especially with the division and everything that's going on in the country right now, you know, Dr. King and always encouraged America to be better. And that's what I, I love most about him is that, you know, we get to times when people find reasons to be at each other's throats. Mm -hmm. And and Dr. King basically said, you know, we're, we, we want equality, we want justice, but we want America to be its best self. And so that that that's what sticks with me, because it, there's always something to divide us. There's always something to cause us to 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 go off the rails. But, you know, Dr. King was always about, you know, don't forget those who are poor, those who are, uh, are suffering injustice. And as a country, we should be better. So that's no, that's I, 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 I agree. It, mm. You know, Dr. King said one of the many things he said was our, you know, the greatest thing about America is the right to protest. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not something a lot of people in the world enjoy, the ability to mm -hmm. protest their own government to make it better. Right. Uh, and here we are in 2021, uh, and it sure seems we're not too far removed from 1960. Correct. Mm -hmm. In the 1970s, mm -hmm. unfortunately, Correct. we're still fighting yeah. about voting. Yeah. We're still fighting about yeah. what gets taught in schools about African-American history. Right. We're still fighting yeah. uh, about, you know, 
poverty and mm-hmm. war and the same things Dr. King um, was uh, was talking about. And I said this on my radio show last week. Whenever we get to MLK season, I like to just tell people, remember, don't remember the Disney version of Martin Luther King. Right. Mm-hmm. Remember that Martin Luther King was the biggest revolutionary that existed when he was alive. Yeah. Like these were radical ideas yeah. uh, about race and about poverty and about war. These were radical. He was, mm-hmm. do you, I mean, y'all, I'm not, I'm saying this, you know, I'm using uh, rhetorical language here, but do you know how unpopular Dr. King was when he, when he died? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. He was one of the most unpopular people in this country. Yeah. He was not this beloved figure that, he has been transformed into this cartoon version and that his legacy was only, I have a dream. It was, it was a radical protest about poverty, about corporate excess, about race and, and these things that we just always need to remember that's who he was. And although the country might not want to remember all of that, that's what he was. And that's what he was to us. Uh, And that's why this is such a big deal to do this. That's what I, that's why I mentioned to you is that where we come from, where we've been, when we were receiving all the water hoses and dog bites and all those things, you know, I was just thinking, I was at Selma uh, when they had the celebration and walking across the bridge and everybody had tears in their eyes, you know, realizing, look, look where we are, you know, and Dr. King is not here to witness this, but we had our president there, we had uh, John Lewis there, we had so many people there just to witness the, uh, what was the 50th anniversary mm-hmm. yep. uh, of, um, the, uh, what's that, Selma? And um, I, I was just uh, I was just surprised just to see all the folks were there. It wasn't just our people. It was all of the people, everybody from everywhere. And I was like, wow, look at this. We've come, we've come a long way. We still got to go a little bit further. So that we can, um, and maybe not we, but people can of color can experience right. the freedom to continue to be what they want to be. I just feel like we had we were making a lot of progress, and we reached a point, mm-hmm. and now I think we're descending down the mountain. Speaking of, of speaking of voting rights, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we're going down uh, with the voting rights and and the new laws. Yeah, I mean, come on, who? Those folks are going to go down in history and it's not going to be in a pleasant way. You can't take your mother, if she's in the line to vote, you can't go give her a sandwich. You can't give her any water. And I think those are some ridiculous, I'm just going to go on the record. I, I think those are some ridiculous laws. No, they are. And, and they're the same battles to a certain extent we were fighting in the 60s. And not only that, but um, this police brutality stuff mm-hmm. right. that we have going on is also reminiscent of those times and and you know what also what always strikes me about not just dr king but malcolm x these brothers knew they were going to die yep. on behalf of their people that's correct yeah, yeah. and yeah. if that just a little bit of that spirit doesn't kind of get into all of us and make us work a little harder and do a little more in the community and be a little bit more positive and and be a little bit less you know critical of other people in the community we go a long way that's yeah. correct yeah that's correct. Yeah. yeah but meanwhile uh, next time I'm in the parade, have me a better line. While I'm talking about that, <laughs> you better have me up in the parade. You better have me in the 42s or something last time, man. And you know what I tell everybody? You know what I tell everybody? You're going to be in the front next time. Okay, I bet. Because you said the same thing to me. With that same grin. You, go have, you put that you're same in, grin. You're going to be in the front. Everybody's in the and, front. And the, the, there's only a couple things you got to make. If you're in the parade that you got to watch out for. Uh, one, you got to have you know the right car, truck, or convertible. You got to rent, whatever. Two, you better not run out of candy or beans. That's right. <laughs> and the first time I was in the parade, you know, I just got elected, and damn it, if I didn't run out right when I made that, because t- I thought we were pretty much near the end because mm-hmm. I had been in it before. I said, like, oh, "Oh, good." And I made that left, and I saw, I was like, "Oh my God, this this is where all the people are." <laughs> so I mean, I had to get out and shake hands to cover for the fact that I didn't have no candy. Right. Right. Me, but right. I got out the car and was walking and saying, "Hey, to everybody!" And all the little kids was like, "I don't care about all that." <laughs> And so I, that will never happen again. We're actually having a parade participant meeting tonight where a representative from uh, everybody that's going to be in the oh, parade, good. we have them come and we give them the do's and the don'ts. But one thing I encourage, and, and I, I I say it like this, put stuff on your float in your cars that represent Dr. King. 
This is not a party. Right. This is not a street party where we're just going to have the cars jumping up and down like right. I see in some other parades, mm-hmm. you know, and we're going to have a safe parade. And I, I just want to take a, a minute to say that, too. Again, we're going to have a safe parade. We're going to actually have people walk up and down the parade route, giving out hand sanitizers, giving out masks, so we can continue to keep it safe. Yep. Because a lot of people are, I'm not going to come out there because of COVID. You know, we can't stop COVID. We got to work together on that one. But uh, we can continue to try and battle to make it safe for folks to come out there right. and enjoy themselves. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate this. Uh, I always uh, I always appreciate because I know it's a lot of hard work because it seems easy. It's just a parade. It ain't just a parade. It is. I know how to, I know what it's like getting all those people to act right and do right and be okay. Uh, And I appreciate all you'll do and and please keep it up because we missed it these last couple of years. Wasn't your fault. We missed it because of what was going on, but we're back and I can't wait to be there uh, on Monday. So I appreciate (laughs) it. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it. Of course. All right, welcome to another segment of Vanguards of Democracy. Here, I'm your host uh, Sean Shaw, and I'm I'm joined by one of the pillars of the Pinellas County community, my fraternity brother, uh, Reverend Watson Haynes. Watson, I appreciate you joining us today, brother. I'm glad to be invited. Um, you know this this show is obviously uh, it's mine, so we have a lot of omegas on this show, and I ain't <laughs> I ain't apologizing for it. So when y'all want to have somebody else, y'all have y'all podcast. There but <laughs> but right now in my house. Uh, we have a lot of uh, men of Omega, but not just because they're men of Omega, it's because they're doing wonderful things in their respective communities. So I want to talk about about you, brother. You are the founder, CEO of the Pinellas County Urban League. You've been doing this uh, a long time. You are a pillar of the community. I just want to know the story. How did you first get into activism? What drove you to the betterment of the community being your mission in life? Because we all there's a reason we got here. How did you get here? Well, actually, well, actually, people ask me that question, and I say that uh, I did it even at St. Pete High School. Uh, I, the teacher asked me, says, um, what do you want to do when you graduate? And I said, I want to be an engineer, sit in a corner somewhere, and don't have anybody to bother me. And uh, she said, okay, well, here's what I'd like to do. You know, you speak well and all those things. She said, I'd like you to run for office here at St. Pete High School and uh, give a speech, and I'll give you a grade. Well, you know, it was important for me, being in a predominantly white school, to get a good grade. Mm-hmm. And so I gave a great uh, a speech. Uh, she critiqued it. But I had won a landslide election uh, over four other uh, people who ran for office. And so somehow I ended up being diverted into hunger marches and all kinds of things. You do not sit in a corner and nobody bothers you. So right. Whatever you wanted to do, you got the opposite of it. Exactly. She changed that whole scenario in just right. that short period of time. And so from there, uh, in getting involved in demonstrations and stuff, it just moved me to another level. And then getting involved with people like uh, Morris Milton and Perkins Shelton, those kind of folk, uh, Roy Holmes, um, they got me involved in politics. I had a school teacher, uh, Olive B. McLean, who actually – would have me to pick her up to take her to a meeting. And as a result, I was stuck in those meetings. So I became the youngest person to serve on the board of directors of the NAACP in St. Petersburg uh, some 45 Mm -hmm. years ago. Tell me, you're the president CEO of the Urban League in Pinellas County. What does the Urban League do? Um, What's the mission? And and how long have you been, uh, been in that position? I've been in the position uh, as present CEO of the Urban League for 10 years, although I was at the table with United Way 42 years ago where I was the advocate for funding the Urban League when I was on that United Way board. So I've been a supporter of the Urban League for some over 40 years and everything that I've done. Uh, the Urban League, actually, every Urban League, there are 90 Urban Leagues throughout the United States. Every Urban League is designed to respond to the needs of the people in the community. So while this Urban League has uh, done a lot in health, we've done a lot in economic development, we've done a lot in housing, um, we, we move to the next level based on the needs of the people in the community. So we're not the, we're not the Tampa Urban League, we're not the Jacksonville Urban League, we're not the uh, Urban League in Chicago, we're the Pinellas County Urban League, responding to the needs of the people in Pinellas County 
And we have some surrounding counties where we offer services for uh, elderly. What are some of the programs the Pinellas County Urban League does? Well, first of all, uh, Urban League in Pinellas County for years have been known as the people who turn your lights on. Well, we're not that. We, we do serve about 6,000 people uh, in, in 24 counties where if their utilities are about to be shut off, we actually provide the services to keep them in, in effect. We have a weatherization program where we weatherize houses against these um, bills where the people come in, they, they say this bill is high, I don't know what to do. We seal the house. Uh, and prevent that that weatherization uh, to uh, cause them to get their houses taken care of. Uh, We have health programs. We have a a health mobile that goes throughout the community. That mobile unit uh, used to actually be run by the Black Nurses Association. But we did preventive things. We took people's blood pressure and all things that they couldn't go to the doctor to get done, and we have that done. We have youth programs. We have... uh, summer youth program called STYLE, where we take kids uh, 14, 15 years old, and uh, sometimes it's 50, sometimes it's 100 kids, where we actually work with them for eight weeks during the summer. We give them a stipend. They come every day. We do things like etiquette, uh, job dressing, uh, interview skills, uh, those kind of things, and, and team building with those kids. Then we offer services for people who are in need of financial assistance. Uh, but most of us uh, have challenges trying to manage a checkbook. Uh, and when your resources are, are really low, we try to figure out how you can spend money and then have money to spend on yourself. Uh, you know, the worst thing you can do is just work and work and work and do nothing for yourself. And so we teach people how to manage and how to budget. Uh, we're in the process of building homes now. We, we just completed our first uh, three-bedroom home. Uh, and getting ready to start the construction on the next two. Uh, and then we're moving into some larger developments uh, with Tropicana Field. I want to ask you, we're, we are shooting this podcast right now in Hillsborough County in Tampa. And our chronically, historically uh, disadvantaged area is East Tampa. Over here. Uh, the one over in St. Petersburg is South St. Pete. And... It is the same kind of thing that's happened over here. Everyone knows it. Every time someone runs for office, we all going to fix this. Every time someone runs for mayor, we all going to give some attention to this. And then four years later, two years later, it ain't much better. What's going on in South St. Pete? What would you like to see go on? And how do we have sustained success over there rather than a ribbon cutting here, street naming here, and then nothing changes? Well, this is one time in the history of St. Petersburg that a developer has partnered with an organization that has that stability. Um, Midtown Development hasn't been selected yet by the new mayor, but it's been recommended by the uh, former mayor, uh, keeping in mind that uh, the mayor, the current mayor, and I grew up together in, in gas plant. But it's a serious— current mayor is a member of what fraternity? Oh, golly, he I happened know. to be Omega Sapphire. I know, it's Omega Sapphire, ain't it, brother? <laughs> there you I'm just, go. <laughs> I'm just checking. But uh, the beauty of uh, what's going to happen is I might not be around when all the Tropicana field is developed because we're talking about a 25-year project. But the fact is that the Urban League's partnered with um, Midtown Development. We are one of the major partners. We're not a minor partner in this project, such that the Urban League for the next 25 years we have that uh, involvement with the development of Tropicana Field. So when you talk about putting up a convention center, or putting up a major hotel, or putting up housing, uh, artist uh, events, that's going to be coordinated through the Urban League. Uh, and we are part of the decision-making of Midtown and not just uh, somebody who happens to be sitting in the room because they're checking the box. Right. Uh, you can't check the box on the Urban League. Uh, we've got too many resources outside this Urban League and other Urban Leagues in Florida and the other 90 affiliates, and then there's a National Urban League office. Uh, we're not somebody who just comes in and takes a check and, and run away. Uh, they're stuck with us if uh, Mayor elects, uh, Mayor, current Mayor, ser- uh, selects Midtown to develop Tropicana Field. We're already there. Uh, we don't have to strike a deal. The deal's been struck. We've had a, we have legal documents that govern our processes. And, and what is that development, what's actually going to happen? Because I'm interested to see if we can replicate success over here in Tampa. But what's that development going to do, and how is it going to kind of 
address some of that historical need? It's going to take uh, 84 acres of land, and it's with or without the with or without the rays. And we're going to develop whether if the rays stay, we're going to develop. If they go, we're going to develop. Uh, but the key is uh, we're going in with a developer who has the financial resources. So we're not telling the city, give us, give us, give all the money to Midtown, let them do it. Midtown's come in and says, we'll buy the land from you. We'll give you a check for $60 million to get this project moving. Uh, Midtown has already had us doing charrettes in the community. And it agreed with us that if they get selected uh, by the mayor to proceed, we're going to redo those charrettes and bring in some of the former people who uh, bid to do this project and find out from them, what did you want to do? Do you have the resources to do something? Can we start early uh, and uh, get these resources going? So this is not just some brand new thing that uh, some politician can grab a hold of and say, I'm going to do something about it. You're going to do something about it, but you're going to have to work with the Urban League and the developer to get it done. No, that's that's that is very important because uh, you just mentioned what a lot of things sometimes is to check the box, sometimes it's just a politician saying it, sometimes it's just a press conference, and then you don't hear it again. Um, this thing it's going to take. It took a long time for these areas to get like they are. It's going to take a long time to fix it, uh, and it's not just throwing money at it. It is, you know. I mean, you all have the same problem in South St. Pete. I know it's a food desert in certain areas. They, they just need a grocery store in certain areas. They need affordable housing in some areas. They need jobs in in certain areas. And uh, sometimes it's hard to get the rest of the city to understand the basic problems in those areas, right? Because certain parts of the city can't imagine not having a Publix a mile away. Right. They certainly can't imagine not having one within five miles, anything. And those are just problems that everyone needs to understand. Parts of the city have different problems and they need to be addressed in different ways. Well, our goal is to to really work with Everybody, you know, um, Sugar Hill, which is the other group that uh, that's on the mayor's desk, uh, they have some plans. Uh, they put into motion some things that they want to do that's not around uh, the Dome area, uh, around Tropicana Field. And our goal is to help them. Right. Uh, that we're in, we're going to say there's a food desert over there and you've got some resources to make this happen. Our goal is to figure out how to make it happen. But the, the community belongs to all of us. Mm-hmm. It's all of ours. So whether somebody comes to Tropicana and, and purchase something from the retailers there, uh, we want them to also go to the mall. Uh, we want them to also take advantage of what's downtown because we're trying to create a seamless community. and That's how you do it. That's how you do it. I love St. Petersburg. Let me ask you a question, uh, brother, because it it's an interesting one, I think. You were one of the people that if you're running for office over in St. Pete and Pinellas County, they're going to call you. And for better or for worse, as you <laughs> one of the people. How do you de- – I ask this of community leaders, particularly African-American community leaders. How do you determine who to support? What are the things that you look at at a candidate to say that out of all the people running, that's the person I think would be best, and that's who I'm going to support? Because you've been around. You probably know all the major ones running in a seat. How do you determine where you're going to go and then you're going to go to the community and say, I'm behind this person? Because it's a, it's a lot of pressure for you to get behind somebody and then the community says, well, Watson supports this person. So it must be – I know it's not an easy decision. What do you look for? Well, for, uh, first of all, the, uh, because I have one good shield, and that is the Urban League does yeah. not endorse candidates and uh, does not allow an Urban League to endorse a candidate. So I move that out of the way. Mine is, what's your passion? What's your truth? What's your record? Are you just out here to run because you've got nothing else to do? Uh, are you out here to make a difference? And, and what, what is your plan? And normally what will happen is someone will talk with us, and I'll say, here's what the Urban League does. How do you fit into that plate? Uh, and you know, I can't go out and tell somebody, I'm endorsing this guy because I really like this guy. And they said, but you run the Urban League. What impact will it have on the people that you serve? And, and that's where I could take it from. Uh, if you uh, can't do anything to benefit the people that I serve and they are what it's called the least of the least, then uh, I don't need to even in- indicate my support for you, even if I might like you. Uh, yep. It's it's more than like. It's, it's about serving the people that the Urban League serve and how do we do that to serve them and the community at large. That, that's a great answer, and and I knew that, that but I wanted to bring it out. Because there, you know, all of us have friends that are in office or running for office, but that's 
that's not what this is about. And I've particularly here recently, I've gotten crossways with some people that are my personal friends, but I'm like you, you know, the record means something, the the passion means something, the, uh, and running for office shouldn't be your record of community involvement. No. In my opinion, a candidate is not, a candidacy is not community work. No. That's, that's something that you run for office. What were you doing prior to being a political uh, candidate? That's what I want to see. I don't want to, well, I ran for this and I, I, no, no. What were you doing that allows you to now run for this and things propels you to the next, the next stage? Yeah. And you've got to have a record. And, yeah. and even if um, you come around the second time right. uh, and you've served in office, show me your record. Show me what you've done. I want to ask, we're talking about community service and we're running up on uh, Martin Luther King holiday weekend, which over here in Tampa, you know, we have our things that we do, the the MLK breakfast and then the parade. And I know you all have the similar uh, things going on. I just want to talk about kind of what do you do during MLK season, your parade? I got to make it over there because I just hear it's massive and huge and I want to, I want to see it. But what do you all do over in Pinellas for MLK parade? And I even want to ask you, what do you, what's Dr. King's legacy to you? these days because you know personally it appears to me we're fighting some of the exact same fights from the 60s and 70s and that is not a good place for us to be but uh, kind of what's your schedule for MLK holiday and well and there, there'll be parades and there'll be uh, uh, singing events and all but uh, my thing is what is it that the person's going to do to make a difference in the lives of people marching up the street up and down the street with a, a band that is not the answer. You want a day of yeah. service. We want a day of service, but we also want to focus. We need to focus on voting rights. Yeah. Uh, people are losing their right to vote by actions of people, not only locally and nationally, uh, but even in the state of Florida. What are you doing about that? It's it's more than just you know clinging uh, some symbols together and buying barbecue on the side of the road. Uh, Martin Luther King was not about that. I've never seen him at a barbecue. I have no pictures of him being at barbecue. He was getting the people motivated to do something about their conditions. And that's what Dr. Martin Luther King Day is about. Even community service, you don't have to wait for some group to do a community service. Do it yourself. Go go get in the back of your own car and go feed somebody. Uh, go take some kids down uh, that's 18 years old and get them registered to vote. That's what that's all about. It's not about just having a good time and having a day off. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, the people in this community that I have the most respect for, people that see a problem and do something about it, rather than meet about it, rather than have a candlelight vigil about it, rather than to have a blue ribbon panel about it, rather than to put it on a T-shirt. Why, they just do it. Um, people need to be fed over here. We just going to go do it. People need to be the uh, – those are the ones that I have the most respect for, and they just do it uh, because they're not worried about who's going to be in the paper about it. They're not worried about who's going to get recognition. They just do it. And those are the ones that that I uh, that I gravitate towards the most. 2022, uh, Watson. Here we are having some of these same battles that have been going on for decades, and we're going to end the show here. What do we? Why are we here? We're here to make a difference. You know that was what my parents and grandparents had to deal with was Jim Crow. We're dealing with Jim Crow Jr. He's dressed different. He looks different. He talks different. And so the things that he does to us now is not what his parents and grandparents did, but it's similar to what they did because he lived under the same house. That's why when we're talking about changing people's mindsets and those kind of things, it's an individual thing. If you hear somebody talk about racial issues, jump in there and stop them. Uh, it becomes our responsibility to change minds and attitudes. We don't have to wait for somebody to do it. And also maybe – Spend some time with people that don't think and look like you. Because you and I go going to think the same on everything. We're just talking to each other, though. The people that need to hear the things that maybe we need to say, and maybe th- he, we need to hear things that they need to say. you got to get outside your comfort zone sometimes to have those discussions. And I've had the most fruitful discussions when I've been talking to people that I thought at first I didn't want to have anything to talk to, that I thought my mind was closed, and I didn't think that they were worthy of my – I've had some of the most fruitful discussions just because I learned. And that's what it's all about. Um, You can't learn. It's almost like being married. Uh, I'm married, but I've been married a long time. But we don't see eye to eye on everything. So why would I expect everybody who support me, uh, who comes to my organization, to to see eye to eye with me? 
I expect to, to have the critics. I expect to have those people who says, I don't think you're doing what you need to do. I disagree with it. That's okay with me. Let me know that because at least you gave me a chance and to be heard. Yeah, let's talk. Watson, I appreciate it, man. Thank you for coming over here from Pinellas. Keep doing what you're doing. And uh, I'm going to keep uh, spending time in Pinellas. And I know we're going to run across each other, but I appreciate you coming over. If not, we'll sell your house over in the gas. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. You know, I got a boat and I head over yeah. there pretty often to Pinellas. So I appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, thank you for uh, joining this segment of Vanguards of Democracy. We appreciate it. Vanguards of Democracy is funded and produced by Vanguard Attorneys, a local personal injury law firm serving the Tampa Bay area with ingenuity and an indomitable work ethic. Don't forget to follow Vanguards of Democracy on YouTube or download episodes on your favorite podcast streaming services like iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And lastly, we're excited to announce that we're launching our new landing page, www.vanguardsofdemocracy.com, where you'll be able to ask questions, recommend guests or topics, and stay up to date with news and announcements. It'll be great. If you know how to bookmark a website, this is the one that'll make it worth it. Thank you.